five. There is no such thing as an innocent pleasure, only a guilty pleasure if you're white and British. Four. Sport is fantastic at that. There is nothing like sport for bringing people together. Three. In fact, I could hardly bear to watch Matt Hancock. Well, I'm very worried by the Bank of England's performance uh, for the last three or four years. It's been getting its forecasts horribly wrong. One. We have left off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. Great to have you back, co-pilot. At Prime Minister's questions, Keir Starmer sought to exploit fears about soaring mortgage rates, what Labour are calling the Tory mortgage bombshell. Interest costs on home loans are indeed rocketing, with millions of homeowners who secured fixed deals at 1% or 2% over recent years now facing remortgaging rates of 6 or 7% as their fixes expire. This is a global phenomenon, but the political costs for the Tories could indeed be explosive. Meanwhile, Starmer's positioning Labour as the party of home ownership, a bid to appeal to the middle classes, at least those not close to building sites. (laughs) And shadow levelling up Secretary Lisa Nandy. She wants more council houses to be built as Labour try to regain popularity across their traditional red wall seats. Matt Hancock was meanwhile in front of the COVID inquiry, among the first to testify in hearings which are set to continue until 2026 at the earliest. You're furious, I know, Alison, that already this seems to be an investigation into why we didn't lock down harder, faster, firmer, rather than examining whether the effectiveness of lockdown in containing COVID was outweighed by the huge collateral damage done. But before we go into all that, with England playing Australia at Lords in the latest Ashes series, I know you wanted to say something about the cricket. Alison Pearson, sports correspondent. Who knew? Not so much sports correspondent as cricket widow. I know my place during the Ashes, Halligan. The wisdom widow. The wisdom widow. <laughs> Keep quiet. Bring in snacks. Tiptoe around. Don't say anything. Are they doing well? Never say that. <laughs> I think that my other half during the Ashes always quotes that great John Cleese line from Clockwise, the the film where Cleese is playing a headmaster who's trying to get to a conference and every single thing goes wrong. And at one point, you know, the car's broken up and is in a ditch and he says, the despair I can bear, it's the hope I can't stand. (laughs) I think that's what every England cricket fan feels. Yes, but with the exquisite bad timing, something called the Independent Commission for Equity in cricket has published a damning report concluding that racism is widespread within cricket, which is also sexist and elitist and every other ist we can think of co-pilot. And amongst the frankly fatuous findings that female cricketers playing at domestic professional level are disproportionately white, as are white males from private schools who are overrepresented in cricket. And of the absolutely invaluable role that I think cricket has played in bringing together Britons of different ethnicities and classes. There is no mention. And I wrote in my column in the Telegraph this week that I think cricket has been and is one of the great solvents of racial tension, a blessedly innocent shared passion. I not only know people in my own family, my friends, an Indian doctor friend, a Pakistani surgeon friend, all absolutely loving cricket and being able to commune over memories of of wonderful memories from matches. But here we are, Halligan, these professional DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion officials, set on another perfectly lovely national pastime. And these guys, their income depends, Liam, on finding discrimination and bias And so there it is. I thought it was absolutely appalling timing in the middle of the ashes at Lord's. And what they're basically saying to him is there is no such thing as an innocent pleasure, only a guilty pleasure if you're white and British. A mutual acquaintance of ours, he said, didn't he, that it's a bit like a boilerplate, these reports. You can just insert any word into the basic report and you'll find various aspects of of British life and in particular English life are sexist, racist and all the rest of it. It does seem to me that the 
ECB, the England Cricket Board, they've just had to say that they've concluded that they just have to be, oh, of course, we're absolutely terrible. Every mm. aspect of your report is correct. Yeah. And it does seem sort of open season. I mean, I grew up playing cricket in a sort of crap London suburb and it was one of the most multiracial things that that we did as kids because the Asian kids who didn't play much football, they'd come out and yeah. play cricket and you'd meet their families. And And the West Indian kids were obviously brilliant at cricket. And I can't tell you what it was like in 76. It was one of my earliest memories in sport when the English cricket captain, Tony Gregg, said he's going to make the West Indies grovel, which was a really stupid thing to say. Well, the West mm. Indies team responded to yes. huge cheer among my mates from <laughs> northwest london who came from jamaica and uh, grenada and all the rest of it they absolutely loved it because the west indies of course became such an incredible team they, they were unbeaten for years and they put the fear of god into uh, aussie kiwi and particularly english batsmen for a long time to come and it was a valve cricket was a valve for sharing racial differences and vying with each other and and almost celebrating the fact that we're different rather than trying to ignore it. Sport is fantastic at that. There is nothing like sport for bringing people together. And of course, English cricket has things it needs to address. Of course, there are some old stuck-in-the-mud dinosaurs. Of course, that statement by Tony Gregg was outrageous at the time and it would be even more outrageous now. But the fact is that sport is still a huge unifying force. And I must agree with you, I thought this report was very, very quick to condemn and see a fence where in many cases none was meant. But if you look at the participants, Liam, on this commission, I mean, the chair is this woman called Cindy Butts. And she said in the introduction that the inquiry was set up as a consequence of the broad reactive introspection generated by the public outcry following the tragic murder of George Floyd. I mean, what the hell has the murder of a black American got to do with kind of a cricket and, and representation in Barnsley? I mean, it's absolutely bonkers. And I think I'm afraid that, you know, I did get quite upset in the column because I think that it's dismaying the extent to which so many of our institutions have been taken over by these self-hating white liberals politically correct bores, you know, they see bias and discrimination wherever they look. And I think this is a complete travesty of the truth. I actually was in contact with our lovely Planet Normal guest uh, last week, Dr. Rakib Essan. You talked to him, Liam, about writing Beyond Grievance, what the left gets wrong about ethnic minorities. And Rakib was absolutely incredulous about this report, saying that the United Kingdom, arguably the most successful multiracial democracy in the world. And a big reason for that is that our national heritage, of which cricket is such an integral part, has been helping to bring communities together. He actually cited it in last week's Planet Normal, didn't he? Yes. He talked about, as a Bangladeshi origin kid in Luton, yeah. he and the white kids at his state school got together to whip the cricket team of the sort of posh school down the road. And he called it one of the most unifying experiences of my childhood. Absolutely. And if we look at the England's men cricket team that <clears throat> won the 2019 World Cup, Rocky was pointing out, was so diverse. It's almost a joke. You know, the captain was Dublin-born Ian Morgan. One of the big stars was the fantastic Jofra Archer, huge he hero in, in our household. And then the great team that played in the final included Adil Rashid, a leg spinner of Pakistani Muslim origin. I mean, if this sport is absolutely infested with racial and ethnic discrimination, described in this report as a hostile environment, well, how the hell is this unbelievably inclusive, racially um, mixed an ethnically mixed team, how on earth has that been picked in the face of this appalling racist environment? I mean, I, I'm sorry, I think it's absolute. It, if it was just bollocks, it would kind of be OK, but it's not just bollocks, is it? There's the title of this week's podcast. <laughs> it's not just bollocks. <laughs> right, let's be clear about this. You've just lost your wisdom spurs because the <laughs> Dublin-born... England cricket captain is Owen Morgan. Owen, oh no. <laughs> I know it's spelt a bit weird for your English <laughs> eyes, but it's Owen Morgan. That's one thing. But 
don't worry, you've been sacked from Wisdom. You can always get a job of the Daily Star because we all know, Alison, <laughs> that your secret guilty pleasure is the Daily Star because Daily Star, they don't only have brilliant front pages. They also christened Matt Hancock as Coco the Clown Hancock. <laughs> and Coco appeared at COVID. Oh, Didn't yes. he? He did, he did. And suddenly it was all about how much more we should have locked down. Yeah, I'm afraid this, um, I don't know how much listeners are watching this, but uh, the COVID inquiry You're is... glued to it, I know, aren't you? Uh, no, I'm not glued to it. In fact, I could <laughs> hardly bear to watch Matt Hancock. And there he was doing his Uriah Heat, ever so humble, I'm here to apologise to everybody, didn't mean no people to die sort of routine. And he, yes, as you say, Liam, he said the UK must be prepared to impose lockdowns which are wider, earlier and more stringent than feels comfortable to combat any future pandemic. Absolutely astonishing, telling the COVID inquiry that one of the key lessons to be learned from what we lived through was the importance of being ready to hit a pandemic hard when it first emerges. But we know that doesn't work, co-pilot, don't we? Because it's an airborne respiratory virus and you can hit it as many times as you like, but it will still escape. So there's lots to say here, really. But I think that not only does it show Hancock is... It, well, Hancock is either an idiot who has learnt nothing or he's a backside-covering idiot who is doubling down on his actions to do anything but admit that he was wrong. It reminded me his evidence of those ghastly sessions, next slide please, at Downing yeah. Street, where you had you know, lobby correspondents, political correspondents, determined not to ask any question based in science, but determined to ask the same question as their predecessors so they could get their mug on the 10 o'clock news saying, why aren't you locking down more quickly? Why aren't you locking down firmer? Why aren't, isn't everybody wearing masks? Mm. And so on. Since then... There have been examples of countries who did differently to us, not least Sweden and places, not least Florida, but other countries too who did a less extreme version of lockdown than us and had the same or better outcomes in terms of excess deaths. Yeah. And there's been a welter, a tsunami of academic evidence, even though academics who have promoted this view in the past have been vilified, ostracised, even lost their tenure in some cases – there's been a tsunami of academic evidence that actually, on balance, lockdown probably contributed to mortality rather than reducing mortality. Ghastly as it is to say, and of course, we must make the qualifications that many people did die from COVID, not just with COVID, but from COVID. They tended to be, on average, much older than average life expectancy, or they had unfortunately, pre-existing medical conditions that made them particularly susceptible. You and I never said that no one should lock down. We just wanted discriminatory lockdown. Lockdown if you want. Society will help you if you want to be isolated, particularly if you're older. But to lock down the whole economy, to lock down the whole of the NHS, so it only became a COVID mm. first service. Almost no other country did that, Alison. The impact on children, the psychological impacts, the impact on relationships, the impact on businesses going down, the impact on our economy, 400 billion quid of quantitative easing that's now being expressed in big inflation. Yeah. Why isn't the inquiry talking about these things? Why is it allowing Matt Hancock to spout, as you call it, bollocks? Or was that in another context? <laughs> really? I think it's extremely noticeable in the, it's about three, two and a half weeks now of evidence, isn't it, that they keep sort of alluding to, this has been this last uh, week has always been about the preparedness for a pandemic. And they keep saying, oh, well, we weren't prepared for a lockdown. Yes. And the reason we weren't prepared for a lockdown, the reason there was no illusion in the pandemic plan to a lockdown was because it was universally agreed that the costs of locking a country down would be far too damaging and expensive. So when they say we didn't know how to lock down, you think, yes, there was an extremely good reason for that. I do think this inquiry is already taking on the air of a scandal in the making. I think the direction of it is scandalous. I think some of the legal costs involved, no fault at all to the law firms who are part of this. You know, they're out to do what they do commercially. I'm not criticising them at all, but I think the scale 
of the legal costs is going to be seen as a scandal. The line of questioning, unless they really shape up fast, the one-sidedness of the selection of the witnesses that are coming forward, the lack of focus during this inquiry on the damage done to children, the damage done to non-COVID patients in the NHS. All of these are very, very deep legal waters for the government to get involved with. There may be, you know, questions of culpability, even liability, but the amount of sort of headspace going into this when it comes to our public sector at a time when we face so many challenges on so many other fronts, trying to fix the NHS when we've barely mentioned it, But I do think this is where effort should be focused on trying to get the NHS working, on trying to fix our energy issues, on trying to tackle our housing crisis, which, again, we haven't talked about, but it's very much in the news at the moment. Rather than all this effort going into an inquiry that clearly is going to be one massive backside covering whitewash. Yes. And by the way, I did really enjoy listening to you last week with Nick Timothy. Wasn't he good? He was very good. He was very good. Yeah, as I always say when I'm missing from my column, what we're looking for in my replacement is competence, not actual brilliance. Oh, but, God. He was brilliant uh, in parts. He was. <laughs> no, I was just going to say he was He was excellent. But one thing that did crop up, which I don't think is not right, is that David Cameron and his evidence, the inquiry, basically was saying, oh, but the plans were for a flu type thing, which was wrong. It should have been for another type of virus. And I was in touch with our Planet Normal friend, Professor Shanetra Gupta, who's the Professor of Theoretical Epidemiology at Oxford. And Shanetra said, actually, flu is a pretty good proxy for COVID. So what the inquiry was being told and just took, you know, absorbed without anybody standing up to challenge, where is she? Why is she the greatest expert in our country on this subject? Not there saying, you are wrong, David Cameron. Has she really not been called? Shanetra hasn't been called? I don't think she has. Has Carl Hennigan been called? The excellent Professor of medicine at Oxford University as well. People like Jay Bhattacharya. Carl has been called, but I just think that the fact that this has been noted down and we should have been preparing for a different kind of virus other than flu. No, Shanetra Gupta says, absolutely, that was a perfectly good one to prepare for. She said the mistake was that lockdown was never a suitable tool for dealing with an airborne respiratory virus. And that is a simple, basic fact, Liam. And that has not been stated so far in almost three weeks of this COVID inquiry. Let's not be too quick to judge. There's a long way, a long way to go in this inquiry. <laughs> they may end up we'll, calling... We'll, we'll have changed gender by the time they... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it may be that maybe because of pressure from gobby people like us or anyway it may be that they end up calling a broad range of people you know let's not completely judge it at the moment but here's something i would say the idea of another lockdown i mean you've been quite vocal about this you think society would just go nuts just say no bugger off i would say as sort of the economics guy can we afford another lockdown no lockdown cost 450 billion quid in cash spending right and then there's also the fact that our economy contracted by about 12 percent. that's more hundreds of billions in terms of opportunity cost the only reason we can actually spend that money on furlough on covid recovery loans c bills and so on on benefits at a time when tax receipts went through the floor is because the Bank of England did £450 billion of QE, a.k.a. money creation. That's more in 18 months of lockdown than they did in the decade that followed the global financial crisis. And that post-COVID QE, as I've often said, is more inflationary because it was paid directly to the bank accounts of firms and households. It didn't stay within the financial system like the pre COVID QE. And I think that's a big reason for Britain's inflation at the moment, why inflation is lingering. And I think it would absolutely destroy our public finances if we went for lockdown again. We just can't afford it. And the only reason we could afford it was because of massive money creation by the Bank of England. That sounds like a sort of subtle, inane point, but it's absolutely vital because if we did go for lockdown again, I mean, the the currency would be hammered and family finances would be upended to an extent that would be far worse than is happening now. But it was very clever, wasn't it, Liam? Because 
we keep our eye on current affairs, you're a great economist and so on, I've learned a lot from you. Most people are unaware, really, they just thought, oh, those nice people from the government have given me a bit of furlough, that's great, you know, we're living very nicely, saving a bit of money for a change. That was the depth of most people's perception of it. It's very it's very hard. I mean, I, I tell everyone I meet, <laughs> you know, boring them into the ground that, you know, this is all this terrible financial mess we're in now has come about. You've become very adept at quoting the producer price index. But I'm still uncertain what it is. But no, because that's right. And we can't afford it. And, and furthermore, a lot of people say, People would lock down again, you know, if if they were told to. Certainly there, I think the numbers of us now are very angry. I would throw myself in front of something, I, you know, if I had to chain myself to Matt Hancock. The idea that Matt Hancock, at least four children, were murdered in their homes by horrible parents because they couldn't go to school where teachers could see their bruises. And that man has got the cheek to sit there and say in any future pandemic, he would put children once again to be locked up with cruel parents. I mean, it just it just defies belief. So I think that we would have a certain number of people on our side, all Planet Normal listeners, we would be out. I don't know what we'd glue ourselves to, but we'd glue You're chained to Matt Hancock. <laughs> I'm chained to Matt And glued to something else. And you're throwing yourself under a horse. <laughs> I was, was going to say throwing myself under a racehorse. You've gone from Double E G Grace to Emmeline Pankhurst in... <laughs> Or was it? No, it wasn't Emily Pankers, was it? No, it was Emily uh, Davison Wilding. There you go. There uh, you go. Threw herself, threw herself under a horse. Yeah, absolutely. But no, we must never allow it to happen. And, and if that means civil disobedience, we did a lot better at keeping the lockdown rules, I think, than almost all members of Parliament who seem to have been having even more parties in the palaces of Westminster than were going on in Ten Downing Street, as has been implied by Guido Fawkes this week, including possibly an ex-Prime Minister having a socially distanced drink when she wasn't supposed to. I love. <laughs> well, that's still allegedly, we must say rapidly. But nevertheless, you know what I think. I don't care that they broke the rules. I care that they made the rules. That's the horror, really. In March... The Daily Telegraph broke a story. The former health secretary, Matt Hancock, has described the leaking of thousands of his WhatsApp messages. The Daily Telegraph says it's obtained thousands of WhatsApp messages. On the 100,000 leaked WhatsApp messages revealed. That's from poor so-and-sos, had to go through those. And now, those same poor so-and-sos are going deeper. The stunning incompetence of the British state was absolutely extraordinary. The COVID inquiry may be underway. They definitely knew what they were doing when they took them out of the hospitals into the care homes. But you shouldn't have to wait years for answers. You've got lockdown. There is no way that that isn't going to have a massive impact. If I had sit on that material to protect politicians' dark secrets, I don't think that would have been an honourable thing to do. The Lockdown Files podcast from The Telegraph. Follow now, wherever you're listening to this, to make sure you don't miss an episode. John Redwood entered Parliament in 1987 as the Tory MP for Wokingham in Berkshire. A former banker and head of Margaret Thatcher's policy unit, Redwood is unashamedly highbrow. He won a prized fellowship at All Souls College, Oxford, aged just 21, and he has, over many years, had a big impact on his party's direction of travel. Redwood served in John Major's cabinet and in various shadow frontbench roles under the leadership of William Hague and then Michael Howard. But with his small state low tax philosophy as a standard bearer of the pro-enterprise Tory right, he's wielded considerable influence as an outspoken and incisive backbencher, not least as a staunch Brexiteer. And his widely read blog, which specialises in exposing the inner workings and failings of government policy, not least when it comes to economics, is required reading across Westminster and beyond. Last Thursday, the Bank of England made its shock and awe move to raise interest rates more than expected, by a half rather than a quarter of 1%. I started by asking John Redwood what he thought of the Bank of England's latest decision. Well, I'm very worried by the Bank of England's performance uh, for the last three or four years. It's been getting its forecasts horribly wrong. 
And it's lurched from printing too much money, buying too many bonds, driving interest rates too low uh, into the danger of doing too much the other way. I'm particularly critical of their approach to bond buying and bond selling. And I, I, what I would like to see them do is to say that at these new very low prices for bonds with much higher interest rates, they will not be selling any into the market. They should just let them run off as and when the bonds mature. So I think the extra selling pressure is driving mortgage rates up even more than they need to. We're talking here about the intricacies of quantitative easing, so-called, and now the bank is actually doing quantitative easing in reverse, so-called quantitative tightening. But we will come on to that. How would you describe the current situation with home loans, mortgages in the UK? A lot of people are on fixed rates, but a lot of those fixed rates, of course, are expiring. Yes, well, we know there's going to be one or two million people in the next couple of years who have to roll over their mortgages and they're going to have to borrow at a much higher level than they have been paying recently. And my worry is that the Bank of England's targeted approach to do it all by interest rates and particularly by bond sales is putting too much strain on those with mortgages. Because, of course, those who don't have mortgages but are in the more fortunate position of having deposits are actually going to have a little bit more money to spend because their income from deposits will go up. Do you think this is politically really dangerous for the Conservative Party, the fact that so many people across the so-called blue wall are going to have higher mortgage payments, in some cases significantly higher? Well, it obviously makes the government unpopular and people are sending messages to the government uh, by the way they respond to pollsters and the things they, they say and do when they're communicating with the media. And I can quite understand that. I wouldn't expect the government to be popular at the moment because the economic performance is not good and must improve. When we get to a general election, then, of course, you have a different kind of contest, which is which of the different groups of potential MPs on offer are more likely to solve the problem. And then you might find a rather different polling response to the one at the moment, because I think the current polling response is, do you think the government's doing well and do you like what's happening? And a lot of people say, no, we don't because their living standards have been squeezed more than they wanted. How do we get into this mess, John, where inflation is still 8.7%, more than four times the Bank of England's target, and more than double what it is in the US, where it's 4%, of course, headline inflation? Is this because of the war in Ukraine? Is this because of other reasons? No, it's not primarily because of the war in Ukraine. It was quite obvious that the war in Ukraine put up world prices of energy and wheat and oils for a bit, although a lot of that price rise has now come down again. Uh, But that was something which the whole world had to pay. And what was very noticeable, Liam, was that whereas the European Central Bank area, the Bank of England area and the Federal Reserve Board American area had a surge in inflation over that time period, inflation which had started well before the war broke out, Uh, China, Japan, Switzerland, uh, with also well-known central banks following different policies, didn't have anything like that inflation. So I don't think it's right to say we were just very unlucky and and that a dreadful war came along and disrupted things. The UK inflation rate was almost three times target before the war broke out. And you must blame, I think, the leading Western central banks, Bank of England amongst them, for simply printing too much money, buying too many bonds at crazily high prices and keeping interest rates far too low. They created a bubble. They deliberately created asset inflation because the main aim of the policy was to drive bond prices very high. And quite a lot of the people and institutions that sold bonds then bought shares or property, which then drove shares and property prices high. So we had an asset bubble. And then in due course, as some of us feared and predicted, it spilled over into a more general inflation, which was well set by the time Putin started his dreadful invasion of Ukraine. Indeed, it's always worth reiterating UK inflation was at a 30 year high in January 2022 before Russia invaded Ukraine. You and I have been speaking out against quantitative easing, not when it first happened in 2008, 9. I remember us talking about it at the time. We both thought at that moment it was a justifiable emergency measure. But the UK's QE programme started as a £50 billion support package to make sure our banks didn't implode. It then ballooned to £425 billion. And then during the 18 months of lockdown, we did another £450 billion of this massive monetary 
expansion. Why is it, John Redwood, that so few people, the likes of you and I, but very few others in public life, in the commentariat, have spoken out against this policy and its dangers? Well, I'm not sure why. I'm, I guess there's quite a lot of weight of opinion that will always back the establishment. And all the time it was being introduced, it was a very friendly thing to be doing because it meant there was more money around. And so quite a lot of the other problems were hidden for a bit. But again, I mean, I, I thought the, the first round of quantitative easing when COVID hit and almost unbelievably they locked down so much of the economy, that was a perfectly good response. The bit I was very critical about was the 150 billion they did in 2021 recovery year when the economy was already growing and inflation was beginning to pick up. That was the 150 billion that I think took us into the high inflation. And we saw something similar happening in America and something similar happening in the Eurozone. And very interesting, China is a country with all sorts of political things we don't like and a system of control we wouldn't tolerate, but its central bank got it right, it kept interest rates higher, it's got inflation at 0.2% at the moment, and it's written a very good critique of the Western central banks, particularly the Fed, explaining how expanding balance sheets and then contracting them wildly is pretty bad for an economy. Let's be clear about this, John. QE, it morphed into a lifestyle choice, a sort of economic equivalent of crack cocaine, because it had friends in high places. The financiers liked it because, as you say, it boosted stock and bond prices. Governments liked it because those boosted bond prices meant that governments could borrow more cheaply. The gilts market, in my view, was effectively rigged by QE. I mean, we have to ascribe some motive here, don't we, if we're going to try and understand why this happened so we don't make the same mistake in the future? Well, well let's put a more favourable construction on it because I'm a pleasant guy. I mean, I think they made an understandable set of mistakes because it, at the beginning it looked as if it was working and, as you say, it dealt with other problems. It was good that economic output didn't collapse completely. It was good that governments did have money so they could give it to people who couldn't go to work and to subsidised companies that had to close down. These were very exceptional circumstances. The problem is they carried on with it for too long. And I think a lot of them thought they were going to be like Japan, because as you and I know, Japan has been borrowing huge sums of money at zero interest ever since its huge inflationary blow off at the end of the 1980s, and it's got away with it. But Japan is a very different country. And even doing what they do, they didn't explode money and credit over the COVID period in the way that the Americans, the Brits and the Europeans did. It strikes me, John, that along with QE, there's also been a land grab by the state as the result of lockdown. If you look at the the numbers, and I'm looking at them here, of, of government expenditure, before the pandemic, government expenditure in this country was generally 40 41% of GDP. It then rocketed to 53% of GDP in 20. 21, the main lockdown year. But rather than coming back to 40, it's now at 46 and the projections all the way through to 2028 keep it at between 44 and 46. How has this been allowed to happen under a Conservative government that the state has got so much bigger? Well, I think one intervention leads to another, doesn't it? You intervene to protect people's incomes because they can't go to work and then their energy price goes up. So then you intervene to protect their incomes because their energy is too expensive. And it's only now that the government and the Bank of England are beginning to say, we can't go on doing this. And the, the huge surge in public expenditure is colossal. And I think the clearest way of putting it is that before covid it was £29,000 per household of public spending for the education and health and the other things we get. And it's now £42,000 per household. What is tragic is that as the amount of money going in has gone up, the amount of output we're achieving in the public sector has actually gone down. Uh, and the Chancellor made a very good speech about it a few weeks ago, where he pointed out that there's been a productivity collapse in the public services over the last three years. The more money we put in, uh, the more managers we hire, the worse the results have become. And that is the central issue which the government has to address to defeat the inflation and raise living stance. It's not a right answer to say doctors and nurses mustn't be properly paid. It is a right answer to say that we need to get on top of runaway total costs in these services 
and help the people we really need to work smarter so that they can be well paid for doing a good job. But pretty much the only person at the top of the Conservative Party in recent memory who's been articulating similar views, at least in terms of people in government, was former Prime Minister Liz Truss and her Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng. And it strikes me now that their ideas have become the political equivalent of nuclear waste. Was Liz Truss right, John Redwood? Well, Liz Truss was right about a number of things. I think they overdid the spending as part of their budget package. But what they should have done was have a much better relationship with the Bank of England, because, of course, what really unhinged what Truss and Kwarteng were trying to do uh, was the collapse in the gilts market. And that was much more to do with Bank of England policy than with Truss and Kwarteng policy. You, you follow these things carefully. You will remember that on the eve of the Kwarteng budget, the Bank of England not only raised base rates, but it announced a very big sale of bonds program and confirmed that it was going to sell those bonds at lower prices to drive interest rates up. And that began to destabilise the bond market. Of course it would, because people said, well, I don't want to buy yet because there's going to be cheaper bonds along from the Bank of England. And when the market got into free fall, it was then revealed that a lot of pension funds, including the Bank of England's own pension fund, had massively geared positions in these bonds. And they then needed to make all sorts of extra payments as the bonds fell in value. And that caused a mini crisis. But we also know that the Bank of England could change that at any time it wanted to, because then the Bank of England said, oh, we have overdone this. We're going to buy some bonds again. And immediately the market sobered up and the interest rates tumbled away. So I think what you should learn from the Trust Quarteng experience is that the Bank of England still has massive influence over the bond market and therefore over mortgage rates and other longer term interest rates. And we need to think more carefully about how it uses those powers, because it certainly didn't help the way it behaved last autumn. Again, let's put that in plain speak, John. The Bank of England, just before the Trust Quateng mini budget, which the Bank of England was irked it didn't know more about, and it was irked that Trust and Quateng had decided not to instruct the Office of Budget Responsibility to do detailed forecasts. The Bank of England, when it knew the British government was about to announce a lot more spending and borrowing, therefore putting pressure on the gilts market, started selling some of its gilts into the market as well, putting more pressure on the gilts market. The day before, the timing of that was extremely unfortunate at best. Well, I agree. Uh, all I want to do is state the facts. People will draw their own conclusions about motive and intention. Could it be possible that the bank's hierarchy was, in quotes, trying to punish Truss and Quateng, trying to show them who's boss? I'm not going to make any allegations about why the bank did what it did. Um, for all I know, it was done for the best of reasons because they were right that there was too much inflation in the system. What I'm saying is that it shows that the bank and the Treasury have to collaborate. They have to work together. You mustn't have one policy pulling against the other policy. And we clearly had a period when the policies were, were pulling apart, and that was very unhelpful. You're a very, very experienced parliamentarian. When I just said there, no one at the top of the Conservative Party is articulating these ideas. Well, of course, you are, and you're a former cabinet minister and a long-standing MP. Your blog is very influential, your own personal blog, your writings on Conservative Home, and yet you haven't been directly involved in government economic policy making in recent years. A lot of people think that's a shame. What do you think? Well, all I can say is I'm, I'm very willing to help, and I've always told successive prime ministers and chancellors I am willing to help, as, you, as you've just heard. I'm, I'm not intervening for personal reasons or to pursue personal vendettas or anything. I'm trying to find a solution which is best for the country. And I'm prepared to offer that free to anyone interested and in any form they want. If they want me to just come in from outside and give them a bit of friendly advice, I'm happy to do that. If they want me as an advisor, more formally, we can discuss that. I've always been available to serve if they want me to. You have indeed, and you've got a credible track record, to say the least, when it comes to working in investments as a professional advisor. You're obviously a fellow of All Souls College, Oxford. That puts you pretty much at the peak of your generation in terms of intellect. What is it about British politics that really smart people never seem to get a proper look in when it comes to policymaking? 
Well, I, I wouldn't want to pursue any claims for myself, but I certainly know some very in, in intelligent and well-informed people, colleagues, MPs who haven't been able to help governments in the way they would like to. It can happen. I think you do get groupthink, uh, and I think there's a sort of informal agreement between senior officials, senior quangos and ministers that certain types of thinking are acceptable and other types of thinking are unacceptable. And if your own thinking from the outside is on the wrong side of the dividing line as to what the establishment thinks is real or sensible, then it is quite difficult to persuade them otherwise. You normally just get told your view is very different from the official advice we're getting as if that was some kind of condemnation, uh, whereas it should be an invitation to a seminar to try and sort it out. Didn't groupthink help land the Bank of England and thus the UK in this current inflation predicament? Why is it that there are no monetarists on the Monetary Policy Committee? Why is it that there was very little criticism of QE on the Monetary Policy Committee? The one person who did dare to criticise, and he was extremely articulate, was Andy Haldane, and he ended up, frankly, resigning in frustration. Well, I think it's a very good illustration, and I think it is a great pity there is so much groupthink. And these institutions are always saying, well, we want more diversity, and diversity of people is a good thing, but they never want diversity of viewpoint. <laughs> and surely the main kind of diversity you need around a monetary policy committee table or a board table or a bank table is diversity of view, where other people have got well-reasoned, sensible views you need to consider. And I would certainly take up your point about money. I don't think there's any simple monetarist explanation which gives you perfect results all the time, if only there were. But I don't think a central bank responsible for the whole banking system, liquidity, credit, money, should ignore money and credit. And I find it extraordinary that the Monetary Policy Committee, uh, when it produces its long and detailed economic reports, does not give us any guidance on whether it thinks there's too much money and credit around or too little money and credit around, and whether it thinks it's having a benign influence on money and credit and its circulation or not. Of course, you've got to look at the speed of circulation, the use made as well as the volume, and that's a complication, but it's a relevant part of the discussion. And so now the Bank of England has admitted that they got their models wrong and their forecasts wrong. In their review, will they please take into account the fact that looking at money and credit is an important part of their task? And if they conclude at any given point, uh, the, the fact there's a lot of money doesn't matter. Well, fine, but tell us that and explain why. Indeed, they, they have to consider QE. They have to acknowledge that QE, certainly the post-COVID variant, has been inflationary in my view. Finally, John Redwood, are you sticking with the Conservative Party? Do you fancy going somewhere else? No, I'm sticking with the Conservative Party because I think Conservative principles are good ones. I think there are millions of Conservative voters who still want Conservative principles. I see it as my task to try and help the Conservative Party to implement those good Conservative principles more frequently and more successfully than has been true in the recent past. John Redwood, thanks very much for joining us on Planet Normal. So there you have it, Alison. John Redwood, very articulate on the economy. I have to say, you know, sometimes he gets a bad rap, but in my experience over many years, his writing on the economy has been second to none. I have to give him credit for that. His blog, his interventions in the House. And I think he deserves more credit for just how thoughtful and interesting he has been on the economy over many years. Why do you think he seems to be so loyal to them? I mean, this past week, in fact, I would say that it's all starting to stack up now, really. The falling apart, really, of the Conservative government, the outlook for them in the election general election coming up in 2024, probably the autumn of 2024, just gets worse and worse, Lee. And we've seen Rishi Sunak's popularity fall to minus 31. The Conservatives are now 27 points behind Labour in the Red Wall, where they were hoping to hang on to some of those seats so brilliantly won by Boris in 2019. It's worth pointing out to Planet Normal listeners that the Reform Party, Richard Tice's Reform Party, hit 10% for the first time. Now, I think that a lot of my readers, our readers and listeners are interested. They're declaring themselves to be politically homeless. I had an email from a, a woman reader this week who said, 
It would go against the grain for her to not vote, but she plans to go into the polling booth and write politically homeless. I'm quite tempted to follow her with that. I feel great disgust with most of the broad political options. I cannot abide what this government is doing on net zero, you know, shooting us in the head after they've shot us in the foot over COVID, the slowness to react to what you've been saying to us for 18 months about interest rates needing to go up. Rishi Sunak this week, Liam, saying we must hold our nerve. Hold our nerve. His nerve. Well, he's got four houses or three houses or whatever he's got. This isn't people like him, is it? This is normal people going to be absolutely alarmed about their mortgage payments and their rents. And what is it with John Redwood? He must know. He must know that the chariot's going off the cliff, isn't it? He must know. Well, look, reformer on 10%, as you say, and Labour on 46 and the Conservatives are on 26. So if all those reform people, as I suspect most of them are, disaffected Tories and they all went back to the Tories, we'd be even Stephen on 36% each in the opinion polls. They're not going back ever. They're not going back while this Conservative Party is led by the people it's led by. There is such massive anger and disillusion. And I've been boring you with this co-pilot, haven't I? Trust me, some of them say they want to see the Conservative Party eviscerated. They don't just want them to lose, they want them to be destroyed. So there's a percentage of former Conservative voters who will actively stay home and not vote for them regardless. So the idea, presumably Hunt and Sunak are hoping, oh, inflation will be, you know, under control, a bit more under control, we'll be able to bring interest rates down, chuck them a couple of tax cuts in the middle of 2024, and all the sweet little sheep will come come buying back. No, they bloody well won't. It does look pretty grim for the Tories and they are running out of time if indeed they can hold on until the autumn of 2024 to hold an election. And why does John Redwood stick with them? You know, well, John Redwood, you know, he's fit and healthy guy. He's, you know, very slim and energetic, but he is in his early 70s with huge respect to him. And maybe he just hasn't got the stomach to sort of join another party and so on. I mean, if there was any going to be any backbencher that would have joined a breakaway party or gone to UKIP over the years, then Redwood would have been right up there. But, you know, mm. I mean, he, he's Conservative Party man and boy. He was very close to Margaret Thatcher. And I guess he thinks he should stand and fight for the soul of his party. The Tory party only ever works when it is a broad church. And maybe he's hoping that in the end it will come to his senses. He certainly, and I must give him credit for this, he is not a tribal person, even though he's determined that his Conservative Party does turn around its fortunes. And you know he's not tribal because he gives as good as he gets to his detractors in the Tory party. And he doesn't hold back. Again, when he writes about the economy and all kinds of technical aspects of policy, you know, he doesn't hold back just because it's his own party in power. Again, he isn't everybody's cup of tea. I understand that. But he is somebody, as I suggested in my interview, and I've known politicians like this over the years. I think Frank Field's another from the Labour benches. He's one of these people who's so smart, so clever, so analytical, so on it when it comes to data and trend spotting and so on, that mere mortals sort of can't handle him. They're intimidated by him. They literally joked, oh, he must be from another planet. And we have to find a way. And this goes back to groupthink at the Bank of England. We have to find a way to accommodate in our politics and public life people who don't have conventional minds, who aren't just conventionally Tim Nice but Dim, but Mm. who really do have insights and can see round corners. And I generally think on some issues he can. And that's why I think he's always interesting to talk to. And I always make a point of talking to him whenever I see him. And yet he hasn't had, I think, the run at the top of government that maybe he should have over the years. Now onto our listener emails, the messages you send to us at planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming. We love to read them. And if a few more women could stop doing all those domestic chores and and write to us because we get an awful lot from the chaps. Um, We got a lot of response, Liam, to my piece on the cricket report. Neil says... 
I just spent most of the morning watching our racist, non-LGBT plus misogynist 11 at a place called, of all things, Lords, which makes its <laughs> own classes. You're going to rename it Ladies, comment. but then it would sound like a, <laughs> like a North West London loo. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Lords is now being rechristened ladies. Where's my boater? I'm going down the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> a kind of guilty pleasure, says Neil, all in all, even if England are not doing very well. Anthony says, it is the blind, unquestioned acceptance that drives me to distraction. Surely the report should be subjected to critical evaluation. What I do know is that the ECB will, as a result, impose ever greater administrative and regulatory burdens on small cricket clubs, further damaging the roots of the game. They've already proposed that all club officers should have to undergo compulsory DEI training, all structured around the nonsense that is critical race theory, but this was rejected last year. That will be the end for me, having been involved in cricket, both as a player and administrator, for well over 50 years. I'm sure many people share your views, Anthony. And Buford, commenting under my column, says, It's all becoming so tiresome. Not a day goes by when a permanently offended, woke race baiter isn't criticising our culture, our heritage or our traditions. What's even worse is the capitulation by spineless officials and management. The problem is that these people are like witch finder generals seeking out witches. Surprise, surprise, they always find them. This country is among the most tolerant and least racist in the world. Enough of these trouble causes. The sensible amongst us are not listening to them anymore. It's about time the likes of the ECB realised this and showed a bit of backbone. Here's one from Malcolm. Hi, hooligan. Do you think he means me? (laughs) Well, he must because then he says, and the high priestess of good reason. Ah, I like that. That can only be you. (laughs) She who must be obeyed. The great (laughs) she-elephant. (laughs) <laughs> as Dennis that Healy said of me. Margaret Thatcher <laughs> now that the great unwashed have departed from Glastonbury writes Malcolm I think it would be appropriate for the planet normal rocket to land on the great pyramid stage next yeah. year to impart some of the facts of life of Great Britain Corbyn was given the opportunity a few years ago ooh Jeremy Corbyn so I would have thought that the worthy farmers of course that's the name of the farmer Glastonbury's held in the interests of diversity, should offer you, Planet Normal, the same facility. Keep on rocking, best Malcolm. And here's Marcus, dear co-pilots, in the hope that you are both well and enjoying summer. Yes, we are, Marcus. Have you noticed Grant Shapps, it's the Energy and Net Zero Secretary, is the sort of ever-present member of any cabinet who never achieves anything for the country except always having a job paid for by the taxpayer? His wheeze on fleecing the taxpayer to subsidise more greenery beggars belief. Generally speaking, says Marcus, I understand human behaviour. However, this leaves me blank. One other point is the wokery seemingly endorsed by businesses up and down the country. For example, Curry's are now offering gender reassignment time off for its employees. Is it true that banks have a diversity checklist when offering loans? Is it also true that to be listed on the London Stock Exchange, a business must prove its woke credentials before being considered? If so, what could be done about it? Lastly, and don't think this can be repeated enough, your podcast is my weekly fix of normality and a reminder that there's always hope for these aisles. It's never long enough, but I'll take what I can get. Don't encourage him, Marcus. He'll be going for two hours before long. Uh, This is from Peter. Responding to the marvellous COVID inquiry. Hello, Planet Normal team. I read in the Telegraph that lockdown saved approximately 1,700 lives. This begs the question as to whether or this is a large or a small number. One way to think about this is to calculate how much time each individual's lockdown bought for one of those saved. The answer to this calculation, see my workings below, says Peter, is that each citizen in the UK added about 2.25 hours to the life of one of those saved. So what would I do if the devil offered me a deal in which my altruism didn't benefit some random stranger, but instead I could get the benefit? It's easy to guess that I wouldn't do another lockdown so that I could live for an extra two hours. And Peter has put this calculation, Liam, which you'll be better at working through than me, but he sees the total days of lives saved is 6,205,000 based on a generous 10 years of extra life for each person saved. 
i.e. 1,700 lives saved, 10 years, 365 days. And that's the UK population is approximately 67 million. So the days saved per individual lockdown is 6,205,000 out of 67 million, i.e. 0.0926%. And Peter does say, please feel free to edit, plagiarise as you see fit. Listeners may want to contribute to those figures. I'm not interested in the glory. I'm just trying to nudge people into making sure we don't do it again. Many thanks for producing Planet Normal. It really helped me to discover that it's not me that's gone mad. No, no, it isn't, Peter. And that's just worth mentioning, Liam, that as you'll know, as listeners will know, NICE always when they're about to authorise or or turn down an application for an expensive new drug, will do very harsh calculations based on life years extended and so on. And the lockdown calculation of 1,700 lives saved by lockdown certainly is far in excess of anything that NICE would ever approve for any normal person in normal circumstances. This is from Jane. And we're back to cricket. Back in 1980, a very famous cricketer was interviewed on the BBC, says Jane. He was asked about the future of the game in England. He said that unless the state schools continued to play cricket, future teams would inevitably come from the private sector. Don't hound the private sector for this. They're not to blame. Maybe the ECB should have lobbied the government over the years to keep sports fields so that youngsters could learn how to play cricket. The playing of cricket in state schools is down to the schools, the education authorities and the government of the day. Authorities have sold off the playing fields that were once part of the school. Why to build houses and fill the coffers of the local authority? By doing this, they've deprived a generation of youngsters the chance to play cricket and rugby. For too long, football's been promoted at the expense of other sports, says Jane. I've seen youngsters in both the Caribbean and India play in the streets with a piece of wood, a ball and bits of wood for stumps. They have the desire to play as they've seen their team play on the world stage and wish to emulate them. Neither of these countries are rich, but the children learn by watching their heroes. Very good point. And also the fact the BBC and other, but but cricket is no longer on terrestrial channels, Liam. So a lot of children won't be seeing that every day. And so that's it from Planet Normal for another week. As we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views, email of the week. Liam, your turn. You know, it has to go to Malcolm because... He and I are aligned. In fact, I could be Malcolm Incognito calling you the high priestess of reason, <laughs> she who must be obeyed. So Malcolm, send us an email to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk, put the words mug winner in the subject heading and you will get your revered Planet Normal mug. Don't pretend that's all you call me. If you enjoy Planet Normal, you jolly well should. Please do leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. There are lots of lovely ones to browse if you get a moment. It does help others to find the podcast so that the wonderful Planet Normal family can grow. And as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal, the madness of planet Earth comes back into view. Thanks as ever to our wonderful producers, Isabel Bouchard, Elliot Lampett, Cass Ho and Louisa Wells. Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other. Until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him.